Nineveh repents of the evil ways. God does not destroy Nineveh. Jonah gets upset with God for not destroying Nineveh. Let's discuss what happened in this whole thing. Dealing with this prophet called Jonah. Here's an individual. First of all, let's go back. Let's look at what took place past before we got to where we are today. Chapter 1, God calls Jonah and tells him to go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. Now, he used the term cry out, which we would say preach or proclaim or, or prophesy, but cry out against it because, as we talked a few lessons ago, that Nineveh was a wicked nation. And God told Jonah to go down there to speak out against them because of their evilness. And in chapter 1, Jonah decides that he was not going to go to Nineveh, but that he would go to Tarshish. He gets on the boat, pays the fare, goes on his way to Tarshish. God sends a storm. And this storm is too powerful for the marinas not to know something is not right. These are marinas. They've been dealing with water and boats and all of that for a very long time. They were most likely pros. But they can tell that there was something about this particular situation this particular storm is not like any other storm that we've ever been in so they come to a conclusion something is going wrong they go get jonah jonah gets up from the bottom of the boat and says oh yeah it's me i'm running from the lord throw me overboard he gets thrown overboard gets down to the depths of the sea between the time he gets into the water, we don't know really how long, but ultimately, because he said in chapter 2 that he cried out unto the Lord and he heard him from the belly of hell. Okay, we get to chapter 2. Uh, after God spews Jonah out into dry land, Jonah goes now into Nineveh and begins to proclaim unto them, yet. 40 days and God is going to destroy Nineveh. The king of Nineveh now proclaims a fast and says the beasts, the cattle, the, the family, nobody in Nineveh shall eat nor drink anything. Maybe God will spare the city. So God spares the city because they did that. They went on the fast and they turned from their wicked ways. All right, now we get into chapter 4. It says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. It displeased him exceedingly, and he was very angry. The Bible uses three unique words. Displeased, exceedingly, and angry. Displeased, exceedingly, and angry. Now, I'm just going to deal with the one word, the one word, angry. When you put those three words together, the word angry means to glow. It means to be hot. It means to burn or to blaze. So what is really going on? Jonah is hot against this situation. He's at a blaze. He's at an all-time fire against the fact that Nineveh was not destroyed. Now let me ask you something. Who was Jonah angry at? Was it God? Or was it the Ninevites? Or was he angry at the situation? I want you to think about this. Can you be angry at God's answer and not be angry with God. Because the answer to this whole thing was God spared the Ninevites. How can Jonah be angry at the sparing of the Ninevites or the fact that the Ninevites didn't die and not be angry with God? 
then he goes into this conversation. Now he's praying to God and says, God, I need you to kill me. Wipe me out. Since you didn't kill me when I first disobeyed you, you didn't kill me when I was in the sea. You didn't kill me when I was in the belly of the big fish. Now, you didn't kill me when I was in Nineveh proclaiming what you told me to proclaim. Now, since you didn't wipe them out, now kill me. I would rather die than to see them live out of all that I went through. And here's what I love. The conversation that Jonah said with God, he said something. This is what he said. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now therefore, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. It's better for me to die than to live. I proclaimed your word as a prophet. You sent me down to Nineveh to preach and to cry out against them because of the wickedness that they have done, and yet you spared them. Jonah says, this is why I did not want to go to Nineveh. This is why. I loaded up the boat and went in another direction because I knew, God, that you are a gracious God. I knew that you are a merciful God, and I knew that you would spare the people had they repented. The Bible says that it is not the will of God that any should pass, but that all should come under repentance. So the first thing I would like to say is God gave this word to the Ninevites, true enough. But he gave it to them, not that God wanted to destroy them, but that God wanted the Ninevites to repent of their evil ways, quit their evil doing, and live so that God would not have to destroy them. Now, yes, true enough, Jonah prophesied to them. Now, I want you to hear this. There are two types of prophecies. There's one with condition, and there's one without condition. Or you may call it foretell and forthtell foretale and fourth tale. There is a prophecy that comes with condition, which means this is going to happen to you if you do this. Yet, if you don't do this, it won't happen to you. That's with condition. Then there's a prophecy that's not with condition, which means it's going to happen whether you do this or not. So I say whenever you receive a prophecy, from any prophet or from anyone, make sure that you hear them clearly. And if you are one that are prophesying, that is prophesying, make sure you prophesy clearly to the individual so that they know whether or not this is a prophecy with condition. In other words, do I have to quit my job for this to happen or is this going to happen because God said so? So apparently, this prophecy that Jonah gave to the Ninevites was with condition. Because God did not destroy the Ninevites because they repented, they went into a fast, and they stopped the evil ways that they were doing. Right there, that tells me, yes, God is a gracious God. Jonah was right. He's a gracious God. He's a loving God. He's a caring God. And God does not want anyone to perish. So he gives all of us an opportunity day by day to do right about him so that we don't perish. God says to Moses, he says, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy on. I will be gracious unto whomsoever I decide to be gracious unto. Which means, yeah, there are times that we want to see our enemies punished, but it may not be the will of God that any of our enemies be punished, but that they learn a lesson or take a word or a prophetic word from us. And then they change. The Bible says, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven or which is above. 
once that takes place God says he'll be gracious on whomsoever he'll be gracious on wasn't he gracious to you didn't God change your heart didn't God change your mind so why is Jonah so angry with God for not destroying the Ninevites that God says that my ways are not like your ways God is not like man Man is supposed to live up to who God is, but God is not like man, and God's ways is not like our ways. So now Jonah leaves from having a conversation with God, then he goes and takes him a front row seat. It's as if Jonah went and got him a chair from the theater and got him a bag or a box of popcorn and a Coke. Ain't going to sit back and watch and see how God is going to destroy the Ninevites. Seriously, Jonah, do you understand the fact that God is gracious? God is merciful, repenting of the evil that he said he would do to them because they changed from their evil and their wicked ways. If the church can display that message to the world that yes, God is gracious and all God wants you to do is to turn from your wicked ways and God would spare you. So Jonah goes and he gets this front row seat to see the damage that God is going to do to the Ninevites. But God doesn't do it. So Jonah is sitting here and Jonah goes off into a deep sleep. Jonah goes he makes him a booth he sits here but it's most likely hot so he gets under a shadow he, he uh, a shade he makes something you know to kind of keep him kind of cool because right now on the inside he burnt up he's hot he's angry so now he needs his body to cool down so he gets here and relaxes but it's hot the mercy and the love of god now gets in the operation with the man of God rather than God wiping out Jonah for his anger God prepares a gourd a gourd is a leafly plant and it extends over Jonah to cool him down to relieve him the Bible says of his grief because Jonah is in a messed up situation. So he has this leaf over him and it brings about a coolness. So, but throughout the night, God now prepares a worm to destroy the gourd. Now watch this. Number one, chapter one, God prepares a wind or a, a bad storm. They throw jo Jonah overboard. Then God, because the people tried to roll harder, God calls a strong wind to really stir up some things. So then God prepares a fish who swallows up Jonah, takes him to dry land. Now Jonah is under this, whatever, he, this booth that he has made, and God prepares a goat for him to relieve Jonah. Then God prepares a worm to eat the gourd up. And then God prepares a, a vehement wind, which brings much heat. And the sun now beats down upon the head of Jonah. God is going through some things with this man, but to prove something to him. And he's asking Jonah, are you doing the right thing by you being angry with the fact that I did not destroy the Ninevites? Jonah says, God, kill me. So now he places Jonah in a situation where Jonah really wished that he was dead. I don't know about you all, but I don't ever want to be in a predicament that God is in this predicament because of my disobedience. Because God has a way. He knows how to get to us. He knows that, that, that thing that it takes to cause us to come to ourselves because he's the great and almighty God. There's no thought that can be withhold from God. There's, there's nothing that he does not know. God is everywhere. We call it omnipresent, 
omniscient and omnipotent. God is all knowing. He's everywhere. He's all power. He's all love. He's everything. Jonah gets angry now because the gourd is destroyed. And God says, do you do right to be angry about the gourd, which you didn't work to fix it? Now understand something. The gourd is just a temporary situation. It was only prepared to hold you for a moment. That's a message right there. There's some situations in our lives it was only prepared for us to get us through that very moment while we're still clinging on to it. Let that gourd go in your life and continue to move forward. So God prepares this gourd, but then God destroys the gourd. And Jonah gets upset with God because of the gourd. Now remember, the gourd covered Jonah. Or oh, it's easy, it's very easy to be upset with something that was destroyed that was uh, a comfort to you. But what about to all of those other people? What about even to your enemies who God says love your enemies? What about them? Okay, so now Jonah is upset and God says, do you do well to be upset about the God? And Jonah says, man, I just need to die. I just need to die. And God says, you're so angry and concerned about this God that you didn't toil for it. You didn't labor for it or nothing, but you're not concerned about 120,000 people in Nineveh who don't know their right hand from their left hand. Now you can go either way with that. I don't think it was just only 120,000. The Bible said six score thousand. A score is 20. Six score would be six times 20 plus the thousand would give you 120,000. God says, you don't even want me to spare the city that's got 120,000 people who don't know their right hand from their left hand, which could possibly mean they were babies. Babies in their innocence. Uh, it's a Hebrew like cliche as well. Uh, they don't know their right hand from their left hand. In other words, they are not mature enough. They have not reached that level because they're still babies. So it could be babies or it could be those uh, intelligent adults who may even be spiritually dumb, spiritually blind, or spiritually ignorant, or something like that. Whatever the case may be, we know that it was at least 120. Now, a lot of times in the biblical days, they used the men and then the women and children. For instance, he fed the 5,000 men and then the women and children. So this 120,000, it could have been referring to men only. We really don't know because Jonah did not finish giving us all of the details of the matter. As a matter of fact, the book closes with that last conversation between Jonah and God. We don't know what happened after that. We do know that at that moment that God did spare Nineveh. Later, they were annihilated. But at this moment, God did spare uh, Nineveh. So my question is, have you ever been angry at the outcome of your enemy? Were you upset with the fact that rather than God killing them, God blessed them? Are you a Jonah? Are you just like Jonah? Do you get upset when God blesses the people who you think that he should curse? This is an issue that Jonah was going through in his life. Whatever the reason may be that Jonah had, other than what he told God. But my question to you is, have you ever been upset when your enemy was not destroyed or when bad did not fall their way? If so, <laughs> how did that make you feel? Did you feel like Jonah? Were you hot? Were you upset because God did not destroy your enemy? God kill him up, but God didn't do it because God is gracious. God is kind. God is merciful. This whole book of Jonah is a very good book. It, it really demonstrates to us the love of God and 
the great authority of God. It even shows us how God works even in nature because throughout the book of Jonah we see where God prepared the big fish, the wind, the storm, the gourd, the worm. We see where God took nature because God is in nature because everything moves by the power of God. It, it, it shows us of a loving God who it's not his will to destroy man. God doesn't want to see his own creation, the very thing that was made in his image and in his likeness destroyed. He don't want to see it destroyed. God wants to see it surrender and submit and obey him. That's what God wants. And then when God sends a messenger, God wants the messenger to be fully obedient to him and his will and his word. Only speak the words that he tell them to speak, but go where God says go. And that's important. Next week, we're going to be in Judges, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 10. We're going to be talking about uh, Deborah and Barak. Some say Barak and some say Barak. But we're going to be talking about those individuals. I'll see you all next week.